In the headlines tonight, President Park Geun-hye says the five years after 2016 will be critical for the nation to tackle the issue of Korea's rapidly aging population. In the U.S., nearly 20 history scholars protest Japan's efforts to censor some of its past wrongdoing, especially the wartime sex slavery issue. Plus, Germany and France push for a new peace plan to help end the conflict in eastern Ukraine. Stay tuned for these stories and much more coming right up. Welcome, everyone. This is Early Edition at 6, live from Seoul. I'm Na hyun Gyeong. And I'm Daniel Chen. Thank you for joining us. Well, Korean President Park Geun-hye says now is the time to address the issue of the country's rapidly aging population. That's right. Korea's future depends on what measures are taken now. She says Korea has to turn this crisis into an opportunity. Our Hwang Ji-hye starts us off. An aging population that could damage Korea's growth prospects. That's what the government is concerned about. During a meeting to address the low birth rate and aging population on Friday, Korean President Park geun said the next five years is a crucial time for dealing with the population crisis confronting Korea, which is aging at one of the fastest paces in the world. The president's remarks come as Korea is forecast to become a so-called age society by 2018 with more than 14 percent of the population at the age of 65 or older. By 2020, the trend is expected to worsen as the country's baby boomers start turning 65. The government largely attributes the aging population and low birth rate to late marriages. To tackle the issue, the government pledged to lay out plans to improve youth employment rates, lower the costs associated with marriage, and cut housing expenses for young couples. It also aims to create a family culture that promotes gender equality as a means to raise the birth rate among dual-income households. Korea's birth rate stood at around 1.2 in 2013, the lowest among OECD member states. With the new set of plans, the government is targeting a birth rate of 1.4 in 2020. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. A group of U.S.-based historians say they are not happy about Japan's attempt to whitewash history. They say Tokyo tried to pressure a publisher to change how the issue of Japan's wartime sexual slavery is described in one of its books. Connie Lee has this story. This is a joint statement scheduled to appear in the March edition of the official periodical of the American Historical Association. A copy of the statement, which was sent to Seoul-based Yonhap News Agency, shows 19 American history scholars expressing strong protest against Japan's attempts to suppress statements or water down atrocities in history textbooks, not only in Japan, but also elsewhere in the world. The statement is in response to Japan's efforts in recent months to pressure U.S. publisher McGraw-Hill to change how it described its wartime sexual slavery issue in one of its history textbooks. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe claims there are errors in the history book taught in classrooms, with his administration continuing to deny state responsibility for the country's past atrocities. The group of scholars, led by Professor Alexa Studdin from the University of Connecticut, say that that no government should have the right to censor history, and they accuse the Abe administration of questioning established history and attempting to eliminate references about the country's sexual enslavement of women during World War II. Historians estimate up to 200,000 women, mostly from Korea, were forced to work in brothels for the Japanese military. 
As a collective statement on a specific historical issue is seen as highly unusual, analysts are now watching how this will affect Abe's relations with the U.S. and his upcoming visit to Washington sometime this spring. Connie Lee, Arirang News. American lawmakers are united in slapping stiffer sanctions on North Korea. A bipartisan bill aiming to broaden current sanctions has been introduced and is likely to get support from both Republicans and Democrats. For this story, here's Connie Kim. U.S. lawmakers are pushing to broaden sanctions on North Korea in the wake of Pyongyang's alleged hack attack on Sony Pictures. U.S. House Foreign Affairs Committee Chairman Ed Roy said Thursday, a new piece of bipartisan legislation aims to prevent North Korea from accessing the hard currency that supports the regime. The bill would allow U.S. officials to freeze assets held in the U.S. of any individuals or international companies found to be doing business with the North or who have links to the regime's nuclear program. Those who contributed to the massive cyber attack on Sony Pictures last November would also be targeted. The legislation broadens current sanctions on the North, which are focused on U.S. companies and Americans. A similar bill was passed by the House last year and received in the Senate, but later scrapped. The bill's passage is more likely this time as the U.S. has vowed to clamp down on Pyongyang in light of the cyber attack on the Hollywood-based studio. The Senate is also expected to introduce a similar bill. Last month, U.S. President Barack Obama signed an executive order that imposes sanctions against three North Korean organizations and 10 individuals. It was the first time the U.S. had sanctioned any country for a cyber attack and implied more sanctions could be on the way. As the U.S. said at the time, it was just the first aspect of the U.S. response. Connie Kim, Arirang News. Now, there's growing speculation that China has and continues to support North Korea's cyber warfare operations. In an article posted online on the U.S.-based conservative magazine Weekly Standard, Dennis Halpin, a visiting scholar at the U.S.-Korea Institute at Johns Hopkins, suggests that Beijing's computer experts even helped North Korea hack Sony Pictures last November. He said Pyongyang's cyber warfare Warfare Agency Bureau 121 is based at a hotel in northeast China, close to the border, and North Korea's nearly 2,000-member elite cyber hacking team are actually trained in China. The scholar adds that it seems highly unlikely that a major North Korean intelligence operation exists in China without China's knowledge and approval. It's a well-known fact that there's not enough food to go around in North Korea, especially those that are not in the military ranks or the leadership classes. And, of course, we also had a recent report about the lack of calorie intake in that country. And some bright spark in that respect is that North Korea's total grain production last year reached its highest level since the beginning of the Hermit Kingdom's economic collapse in the mid-1990s. According to the United Nations World Food Program and Food and Agriculture Organization, North Korea's total grain production, which includes rice, corn and beans, amounted to nearly 5 million tons in the year 2014. That's 130,000 tons more than its total production the year before. Data shows that the regime's food production has been gradually increasing ever since Kim Jong-un came into power in 2011. However, North Korea is still not entirely self-sufficient and they do not have enough grain to maintain the bare minimum ne necessary for its people due to decreased international aid and losses in productivity from floods and famine. Still on the topic of North Korea, if you're thinking about investing in that country, you will know that it is still a tough country to invest in. It is extremely difficult, if not impossible, to predict what will happen in the reclusive state. Yet the regime continues to seek much needed foreign investment. Our Hwang Sung-hee takes a look at how the world's most closed economy is trying to make money. It's constant military provocations, threats and dangerous brinkmanship over its nuclear program make North Korea the least attractive place for business. But some say the regime is opening up to draw much-needed foreign investment, for example, in tourism. There is now a growing trade in tourism from the Netherlands to North Korea. 
So the North Korean government is now inviting Dutch students to go to Pyongyang to give Dutch language training to the North Korean tour guides. Around 100,000 tourists visit this untrodden corner of the world every year, and North Korea says it aims to raise that number to one million. For that, it has set up opulent new ventures like the Mashingyang Ski Resort. Korea Tours, a Western travel agency that organizes trips to the north, says the regime is enthusiastic about its program proposals most of the time. A lot of projects that we've been working on that have become possible in the last three years or so are things we were working on beforehand. But North Korea's unpredictability is troubling. The regime banned tourists last October on Ebola fears, with no signs of lifting it anytime soon. In fact, North Korea was placed at the very bottom of the Heritage Foundation's Index of Economic Freedom, with a score of 1.3 points out of 100. That's over 70 points behind South Korea and nearly 30 points below Cuba, which came second to last on the list. So it doesn't provide any meaningful uh, consistency in terms of policy. And also North Korea remains, many factors in North Korea are unknown. So I think that's the key risky factor for the investors. Experts say North Korea's handling of the inter-Korean Kaesong industrial complex with its frequent changes in regulations and unilateral shutdowns is a good example of its uncertainty. Despite the problem, Trade between the two countries hit a record 2.3 billion U.S. dollars last year, thanks to growing output in the joint business park. Given the lack of resources and capital, experts say Pyongyang must open up and reform its antiquated economic system. That's the only way to improve the daily lives of North Koreans. But first, North Korea will have to end its confrontation with the outside world over its nuclear program. Hwang Sang-hee, Arirang News. It's finally happening. Top diplomats from South Korea, Japan and China are expected to meet next month. The country's annual high-level diplomatic exchanges had been hampered by territorial issues and Japan's denials of its historical wrongdoing. And this will be the first such trilateral meeting in three long years. A senior official at Seoul's foreign ministry says the three countries are discussing the possibility of holding minister-level talks in Seoul at the end of March. Pundits say the upcoming meeting could also serve as an opportunity for separate bilateral talks on other pending issues among the three ministers. Business partner, they say one day entry ban. We're all digging deeper getting to the bottom of stories that impact your life, talking with you on air and online, connecting you with experts on the world's most pressing issues, news and current affairs at its best, with Na Hyung Young and Daniel Che. On early edition at six. Jordan is following through with its pledge to take revenge on the Islamic State militant group. It launched waves of airstrikes on some of the group's key positions in Syria on Thursday, and Jordan makes clear that there is much more to come. Kwon Soa reports. This is just the beginning, is what Jordan's military vowed after launching its first airstrikes against Islamic State since the extremists released a video this week showing Jordanian pilot Muath al Kasasbe being burned alive in a cage. Jordan's army expressed its will on state television to take revenge on the militant group, showing footage of dozens of warplanes bombing what appeared to be munitions bases and training camps in northern Syria. Tens of Royal Jordanian Air Force aircraft launched consecutive airstrikes to demolish strongholds and holes of the terror organization Islamic State. Iraqi media reports more than 50 IS militants were killed, including a senior commander. After the raid, the fighter jets flew over the hometown of the deceased pilot as Jordan's King Abdullah was visiting the pilot's grieving family. Kasaspe's father, a key member of a powerful tribe in Jordan, reportedly said he got King Abdullah's word that his son's death would be avenged. On the day the gruesome execution video was released, he said the Jordanian government must take action. 
Jordan has already shown its fury by executing two Iraqi militants connected with IS, including the woman Jordan offered in exchange for Kazaspa's release. Jordan's airstrikes were the first since the pilot's capture in December brought them to a halt. Jordan is part of the U.S.-led coalition against Islamic State, but there is still a political divide within the country as to how much Jordan should be involved in this fight. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. The leaders of Germany and France are working together to ease tensions in eastern Ukraine, where the fighting between rebels and Russia-backed separatists is still ongoing. After making a surprise trip to Kiev, the two will meet with Russian President Vladimir Putin in Moscow local time on Friday with a peace proposal. For this report, here's our Son Jung-in. The leaders of Germany and France have proposed a new peace initiative for Ukraine, raising hopes of a breakthrough in the year-old conflict pitting Kiev against separatist rebels in eastern Ukraine. Angela Merkel and François Hollande said they have worked together to draft a proposal based on Ukraine's territorial integrity and hope it will be acceptable to both sides in the conflict. The high-level diplomatic maneuver is seen as an apparent bid to head off U.S. consideration of lethal military aid for the Ukrainian government in its war against the Russian-backed separatists. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry, who had arrived in Kiev earlier, met with Ukrainian President Petro Poroshenko and other top officials to affirm U.S. support for a diplomatic resolution to the conflict. Kerry also urged Moscow to show its commitment to a peaceful solution and to cease its military support for the separatists, an allegation that Russia strongly denies. Fierce fighting has flared again in the region in recent weeks, with rebels advancing on a railway hub held by Ukrainian troops after launching an offensive that scuppered a five-month-old ceasefire. According to the United Nations, the fighting has claimed more than 5,000 lives since April last year, including some 220 civilians killed in just the past three weeks. Son Jung-in, Arirang News. Now, staying with Russia, the country's inflation rate hit its highest level in 16 years last month because of the falling ruble. Russia's statistics service Rostat says January's inflation rate amounted to 3.9 percent compared to 2.6 percent a month before. This is the highest pace of inflation in Russia since February 1999 when consumer prices grew by over 4 percent in one month. January's rate was also considerably higher than Rostat's forecast of 2.7 percent and Economist's outlook of 2.6. Now, the figures come just days after the country's central bank cut its main interest rate from 17 percent to 15 percent, citing stabilizing inflation. Chebel is a term unique to Korea. A lot of business majors would have heard about the term family-owned conglomerates in Korea. We have one story that focuses on an auto giant here in Korea. The chairman of Hyundai Motor Group and his son have sold around 13 percent of their stake in the group's logistics unit. Analysts speculate the move was made to raise cash for the son and heir apparent, allowing him to purchase shares in key units and solidify control over the firm. Our Kim Minji has more. The chairman and vice chairman of Hyundai Motor Group have offloaded some of their stakes in the group's logistics affiliate, landing them some one billion U.S. dollars in cash. Chairman Jung mong gu and his only son and deputy Eui Sun sold over 5 million shares in Hyundai Glovis, or 13.4 percent of equity in a block deal, according to industry officials on Friday. The price per share stood at around $210, 2.7 percent lower than the previous day's close. It's also down about $45 from what the family initially offered at their first attempt last month, which failed due to disagreement over sales terms. The sale comes as Hyundai Globus has to meet a revised antitrust law on intra-group transactions. The law, which takes effect this month, calls for up to three years in jail for controlling shareholders, owning a stake of 30 percent or more, if they carry out intra-group transactions that benefit them. Now with the stock sales sealed, the combined stakes held by the chairman and his son dropped to 29.99 percent. Analysts also see the move as an attempt to raise cash for the son and heir apparent, needed to increase his control in the automotive group by purchasing shares in key units.
Kim min -ji, Arirang News. On the defense front, the clock is ticking for the South Korean military to replace its aging fleet of fighter jets. They are screaming retirement. They, some of them belong in museums, some would say. Uh, they even gone over, way past their lifespan. Arirang News' Kim Yeon bin looks into Korea's plans for making a smooth transition when replacing those jets. The Korea fighter jet program aims to develop 4.5 generation fighter jets to fill in the gap with more advanced technology, as a batch of Korean fighters are set to be retired in the coming years. South Korea's Air Force has around 400 jets in service, but roughly half of them are antiquated jets, such as the F-4 and F-5. These days, fourth and fifth generation fighters are the mainstay globally, but Korea is lagging behind with mostly third generation jets. Korea has set aside roughly $17 billion for a project to develop and mass-produce 124.5-generation fighter jets that will replace the Air Force's old F-4s and F-5s. The KFX jets are scheduled to be integrated into the Air Force in 2025. On top of that, Korea recently signed a roughly $7 billion U.S. dollar deal with Lockheed Martin for 45th-generation F-35 stealth fighters, though there are some concerns. Some experts worry that a delay could push Korea's already old fighter jet fleet to the limit. South Korea's defense ministry says it's looking into other options, such as enhancing the performance of the current KF-16 fleet and tanker aircraft to fill in temporarily. The KF-X, however, will not be Korea's first homegrown fighter jet. The F-A-50, which finished development in 2011, was integrated into the Air Force last October. That jet has already caught the eye of international buyers. Korea has exported more than 50 of them to Iraq, Indonesia, and the Philippines. Seoul also plans to sell 24 F-A-50s to Peru this year in a deal worth some 2 billion U.S. dollars. Kim Hyun bin Arirang News. Welcome back and happy Friday everyone. I'm Michelle Park here with the latest weather forecast. Now due to the unseasonably warm weather, spring herbs are already out in the market and they are full of vitamin B and C and effective in overcoming fatigue. But you have to eat properly in order to get the right effects or else it would just be toxic. Now make sure to rinse over running water, parboil and cook well with the right ingredients. Now, tomorrow's weather fits well with the spring herbs with mild temperatures and good amount of sunshine. But on Sunday, there will be sudden change with large drops in temperatures with strong cold wind blowing. Now, this winter-like weather is expected to continue until next Monday, so make sure to stay warm and healthy. Now, let's go over to our readings for tomorrow. So, we'll start off the Saturday morning at negative 2 and gets up high to 6 degrees while the southern regions such as Daegu and Busan will top out higher at 8 and 10 degrees. Now moving over to other regions, Jeju Island gets up higher at 10, Tokdo hits low at 7, while Mount Kungang is sunny and dips low to negative 4 degrees. Well, that's all for now, Michelle Park, and here's a look at the weather conditions around the world. Well, we've come to the end of this newscast, the last newscast for this week. Do have a great start to your day if you're tuning in from other parts.
parts of our world in different time zones. And if you're watching from Korea, I say enjoy the last remaining cold weather where you can flaunt your wintry Spring outfits. Spring coming up soon. Spring coming up soon, so enjoy it while you can instead of complaining about it. And do have a safe drive home or wherever you're heading on this Friday. Mm -hmm. I've, I've been Daniel Che. And I'm Nahyun Gyeong, wishing everyone a very happy weekend. Daniel and I will be back next week. Bye bye for now.